thank you for this wonderful retreat together. We still have a good 24 hours left. Let us continue to make best use of this precious opportunity. Thanks again to Milan and the New York Sangha and to Maya and the UK Sangha for their great efforts in pulling this together across the Atlantic. And to all of you for joining, participating, being a part of it. I trust you have come to see through your own practice through your own experience, the boundless joy of genuine practice, really giving all of ourselves to this, to what is real, not running away, escaping, from anything. Those delusive thoughts and feelings hidden in the lotus threads, as was mentioned in the beginning of the first Dharma talk. I trust you have come to see what is referred to in terms of our own practice and experience and life. To sincerely, humbly see, open up to what is underfoot. And yes, sometimes what is right under our feet is hidden, is not clear. So we must have the patience and the courage to look again and again. Through proper practice, the mind naturally comes to rest, comes to a halt, to a full and complete stop. This is the point of what is called samadhi or deepening this into jhana as the Sanskrit or Pali term jhana or jhana refers to, but not just letting the mind come to a full and complete stop. But then seeing, seeing through what is there. When mind has not yet arisen, has not yet created this and that, good and bad, better and worse, enlightenment and illusion. <laughs> what is there right here, right now, before mind arises? It's early spring here in the Hungarian countryside and you can hear the birds, the bird song, the chirping. I don't know if you can hear it through the wonders of, uh, of Zoom, but uh, they've been chirping all day, pretty much all week. Who are they singing for? Consider well in the depths of your practice, in the depths of your samadhi, concentrated oneness, in the depths of your jhana, deep, deep 
meditation where to all intents and purposes, the self is dissolved, at least temporarily, in that very profound jhana state. Again, not just letting the mind come to a full and complete stop. But then seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching what is there. And yes, even thinking and feeling. Please beware. When we speak of the delusions hidden in the thoughts and feelings, huh? It's not a matter of getting rid of thought and feeling, not at all. Getting rid of the delusion, the defilement, so to speak, huh? so that we can truly think, fully feel. This is the last Dharma talk. So now is the time for us to consider how to bring it home, so to speak. Of course, uh, there's a small group here in Hungary, but most of you are our home. <laughs> you haven't gone anywhere. You've been fortunate to be able to do this retreat in the relative comfort of your own home. But to truly bring it home, as I said in the first Dharma talk, to find it at home, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, and to continue that practice where you are, to find it where you are, not to have some peak experience, can show insight, whatever, and then bring it back to the world to share with all the unenlightened. No, find it here. Find it here. Find it in the busyness, the confusion, so-called, of the world. If you can't find it there, what you do find is probably an unhealthy escape. Beware. Thus, the value of a regular, sustained practice and a healthy lifestyle in accord with that practice. They nurture, nourish each other. Living properly, the practice deepens. As the practice deepens, we find the joy of living in accord with this practice. <laughs> what greater joy? Huh? Proper, genuine guidance is also very important. I've been asked to give these Dharma talks, in effect, lead this retreat. What is my role, my task here as a guide? I would say it is finally to become unnecessary, completely redundant, completely unnecessary, unneeded then our work is truly done. The teacher-student, teacher-disciple relationship is very valuable, very precious. And yet there's no doubt about it in Zen. In Zen Buddhism, that teacher-student relationship distinction is so valuable that finally it must fall away from both sides. If the teacher simply remains in the position of teacher, he's not a Zen teacher. 
if the student forever remains merely in the position of a student, he is not yet a true Zen student. Consider well. Then we can truly serve each other and all others. As mentioned before, the famous quote, so admired and respected in the Zen tradition, quote, insight realization, insight equaling the teacher cuts it in half, <laughs> only surpassing, transcending, going beyond, only surpassing insight is worthy here, end quote. Once again, insight equaling the teacher cuts it in half. Only surpassing insight is worthy here. Mm, from the outside, this can sound like arrogance, hubris, spiritual pride, but it's not at all. Rather, it reveals what is required of the student and the teacher or God. As I said in the first Dharma talk, true humility, humbleness, true humility is <laughs> Being without self. Being without self is true humility. Then everyone and everything can serve as a guide, can guide us back here home. What had seemed impossible a huge hindrance, obstacle in front of us becomes the precious opportunity that it is. As I mentioned the other day, sickness itself becomes its own medicine. Whatever we encounter opens us to this way, the true way to what is truly here. I urge you, keep your eye open. Your eye that is your heart, that is the whole universe. Keep it open wide. If you find that this is your way, there are many, but if you find that this is your way, the way you must go in this life, let us continue this marvelous practice together. I am here for you. And we are all here for each other. Please feel free to stand up and stretch for a moment. I trust you can see again from your own experience. You can confirm it for yourself. Huh? The breath itself is enough. If we give ourselves fully to the breath, it is enough. This is already a wonderful entrance into the way. Hmm? 
if you find there is something deep within that needs to be made clear, a great doubt, as it's called, a great question, problem, koan, call it what you like, it doesn't matter. Hmm. That is united naturally with the breath and taken to the very bottom, to the very end. But you don't need to stir up some metaphysical thoughts or ideas or borrow someone else's problem or question. If we really open up to what is in the bottom of our own heart, under our own feet, that is enough. That is enough. Don't make it more complicated than it is. It's really very, very simple. It's not even one. It's before one. We have plenty of time now in this last Dharma talk to raise questions from out of the practice for the benefit of all. Again, not just about the practice now, but about the practice of returning to the world, so to speak, after the retreat, hmm? returning to our busy lives. How do we continue this practice? Hmm? You still have a good 24 hours. Continue to make good use of it right up till the end. And then, in a sense, the real retreat begins. <laughs> to find out how to naturally let that continue for the rest of your life. Yes, in the busy workaday world, exactly. If it's not alive there, it's not alive. Milan, I hand it over to you for any questions or concerns. Thank you all for listening so intently. If anyone would like to say anything, uh, question, comment, concern, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and speak. Thank you. If anyone here has a question, the same. Hi, could I ask a question, Jeff? Yes, Alan, yes, please. Yes, um, <clears throat> being without self in Zazen is one thing, but um, you mentioned thinking and feeling, and thinking without self and feeling without self this, I guess this is where my, my question arises. And, and the question is a question of the self, I'm sure. But how is it possible to think without self, to feel without self? If I may return the question to you, Alan, Really, how is it possible to feel with the self? Hmm? Hmm? You get in your own way, don't you? You feel, but then you wonder yeah. whether you should feel that way. I've been practicing for 10 years now. I shouldn't feel that way. You know what I mean? I do. So it's delicate. Thank you for raising it. It's a delicate point because so much pop Zen and almost all Zen in the world today, I'm afraid, is what I would call pop Zen, tends toward this notion that 
if you stop thinking or maybe stop thinking dualistically, whatever that means, uh, then you'll be okay. Maybe even if you stop feeling, but the tendency tends to, it, a tendency towards thought is the enemy. It's dualistic. Hmm? Well, this is so silly. It doesn't even need to be criticized, but it's so common. The thought is the surface. It's only the surface. That's why samadhi and jhana must be deepened and sustained. It's fairly easy to be without thought. Whenever we're deeply involved in something, in a sense, we're beyond thought. When we're doing a creative act or when we're performing or listening to music, we're not just thinking about the music. When we read a book and are deeply involved in it, we're not thinking about it, are we? We're sweating huh? with the main character, aren't we? Crying and laughing. So in a way, it's a good question, but it's also a preposterous, ridiculous question, isn't it? I would go so far as to say, to truly think, to really feel, is to be without self. To think from there, yes, of course, human beings think. And we feel, it's not about cutting off our emotions. Again, the delusions hidden hmm, in the thoughts and feelings. Huh? It's not saying get rid of the thoughts and feelings, but what is this delusion, even very dualistic word, isn't it defiled thoughts and feelings? Oh, they're the bad ones, right? <laughs> Alan, who makes that distinction in the first place? I do, and that's where I need to apply the work. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hi, everybody. Uh, listening to uh, your Dharma talk, uh, you say a um, uh, student in Zen, students don't, don't uh, exist and teachers don't exist. And one question arises, arise, um, who am I? Are you a teacher? Are you a student? Are you a male? Are you a female? Are you Mexican? Are you a Martian? What are you? Who are you? It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Practically, I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican. Uh, I mean, the, uh, I have a personality or that, that kind of items. But that's a very deepest, good point. Uh -huh. That's, that's a very good deep. point, though. Practically speaking, you're right. That's right. Oh. That's right. There's nothing. Should we get rid of all of that? Mm. People think perhaps somehow if you get rid of all of that stuff, then maybe you'll be your enlightened true self or something. But I would challenge you that by finding out what it really is to be who you are, a certain age, I'm 68, I won't ask you, but I'm 68. I happen to be an American. I still have an American passport. I live in Japan. Uh, I have a personality. I have a character. I have flaws. I have all kinds of things I could bring up. Yes, that's right. But to see in the depths of our practice, those things are the fulfillment of the Dharma. Are they what defiles? 
What is it that defiles? Alan, would you care to respond? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the self that defiles, <clears throat> Jeff. There's no doubt about that. And is that really real? <laughs> <laughs> Anna, is it? Yes, Anna. Do you want to say anything else? Is it clear? Yeah, I see it clear. It's, it's so... Yeah. But you yourself say, practically speaking, yes, practically speaking, I've taken the role as a kind of a leader, huh? mm -hmm. giving Dharma talks. Yeah. Yeah. Big deal. Mm. But <laughs> if, if I get stuck in that role, I am not a Zen teacher. <laughs> and if you get stuck in your role as the humble, hmm, accepting whatever the teachers, the guru says, you're not a Zen student. That's what I mean. I, yeah. I wouldn't say they don't exist. <laughs> if I may borrow your words, practically speaking, they exist and they should exist. There's a place for them, isn't there? Mm -hmm. But you have to get to the point where you are not simply a student, mm. then you're truly a student. Mm. You understand? Yes, yes, yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Not just playing with words. There's something about the nature of being without self that requires mm -hmm. the student to truly be a humble and sincere student. So humble and sincere that he ceases to be that completely. Mm. Out of love. It's clear? Clear, clear. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you, Jeff. Louis, would you like to say something? I was saying wrong response. I just took the image up. That was a wrong <laughs> response. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I no, well, no and yes. I'd like to come back to what Alan was saying about thinking and feeling without self. It's true, isn't it? We tend to think that we have to be something to think and feel. We have to be someone. We, have, we need a self. And I think, well, for my part, what seems to happen is that in deep practice, the, the, the kind of ownership of thinking and feeling completely dissolves. It doesn't uh, kill thought and feeling. It doesn't... Uh, uh, and nearly hate it. It doesn't no, matter. Yeah. But I don't take it as mine. It just happens spontaneously by itself. So it goes on. You know, it, it, it just arises as it does and as it does not. It's something completely spontaneous. But I don't claim it. There's nothing that claims it. No, it's not. Words are so tricky, so mm. tricky. You know, when one says, I don't claim it, you can feel you then put a self in there. There I am. <laughs> so, so how, how to get, but in, in experience, in experience, when we're deep in the practice, these kind of fine, verbal distinctions 
just are not there. They, they, I'll say something. I was in practice uh, this morning and like uh, Jeff in Hungary, spring is slowly coming in here also. So birds are chirping also. But at one moment, it completely struck me. There's the immediacy of, of hearing a bird singing. The fact of it, not the, I'm sitting here and over there there's a bird singing, but the immediacy of it the closeness of it, the intimacy of it, mm. where that is hearing, that is not <laughs> thinking or feeling, that is hearing. But where is anyone hearing in all of this? Where am I in all of this? Anyway, at this stage, I would like also to, Thank you, Jeff, for giving me this opportunity. So many thanks for all those who are offering us this beautiful seven day retreat. It fills the house. No, it, it is so beautiful. So a, a deep gratitude to all those, all of you and all those who have organized this. Thank you. Marty, would you like to say something? Uh, right now, I just, yeah, I'd like to just kind of go with the flow. Um, first of all, I, I don't know if I should call you Jeff or Bird Chirping Gulps Tea. Maybe that's your name just for today. <laughs> That was a very beautiful moment. And uh, Lewis, yeah, I, I second you on your thoughts about spontaneity and immediacy. I like immediacy better because it has the sense of not mediated by self-concern, maybe thinking that isn't about me or doesn't put me in, 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 a, in the middle. Uh, there, there can be a kind of thinking like that. Alan, if I'm um, walking off the curb into a path of an oncoming bus and you're kind of out of reach, what do you do? You can't, can't grab me. What do you do? I shout. What do you shout? I shout. That's immediate thought, feeling, compassion. I let it go at that. Spoken like a true New Yorker. <laughs> Adam, do you have anything to say? Thanks, Jeff. Um, no. But it's been um, really good to sit with you all, so thank you. Jeff. Yes. Alan? Um, yes, yes, Alan S. Uh, you, you said in your talk um, that a great obstacle is a great opportunity. And I was wondering if you might expand on that, because often our response to a great obstacle is to try and get around it some kind of way, rather than seeing it as an opportunity. And I thought it might be quite nice if you expanded on that, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure you can uh, uh, share some examples from your own life, but uh, what I'm 
going through now. Uh, a year ago, I retired completely from university life and uh, 33, 34 years working. It was a Zen university, but it was a university. <laughs> um, finally, fully retired. Now I can devote the rest of my energies, the rest of my life to these small Zen activities. Huh? It's been almost a year now. And I thought, uh, you know, April 1st, the beginning of the new school year in Japan, April 1st, 2021, almost a year ago. I'm free now. I'm able to do this work. I don't have to worry about faculty meetings, administration, and all that stuff anymore. Huh? And what I ended up doing, 67, now 68 years old, was I ran myself into the ground. <laughs> uh, perhaps feeling like I was still 50 years old, uh, arranging all these things, places that had asked to do retreats for years I hadn't been able to go to, now I can. And I overdid it. And I ended up uh, getting very high blood pressure, even dizziness and vertigo and things like that. And uh, I'm getting, getting good help here, so no worries. But uh, that hindrance became a great opportunity. It may have saved my life <laughs> because I was so stubbornly trying to pursue what I nobly thought I should be doing that uh, I was quite ignorant of the needs of my own body, my own aging body. Sickness, old age, and death. Have you heard that one before, Alan? <laughs> and so it became a precious opportunity of which I had been blind, dangerously blind. Huh? So that's what, what I say. I had heard the expression before, but never really plumbed the depths of it. Sickness is its own medicine. <laughs> I would say for the ego self, this is almost impossible to comprehend because it wants the medicine to stop the illness. Quite rational, isn't it? But when you can be without self, sickness, mornings, uh, sadness over the death of a loved one. My, my oldest brother passed away a few months ago. These become of themselves opportunities. I know my brother David now in a way I didn't know him when he was alive. When I listened to that music we shared when we were young, it brings tears to my eyes. Yes, Alan, deep feelings. Deep, deep feelings, crying for the loss of my brother. And it's a beautiful, beautiful feeling, as strange as that may sound. It's a, a way of honoring his memory. That hindrance is maybe not the right word, but anything becomes an opportunity at that point. Huh? Would you like to uh, comment, Alan S., since you raised the question? I don't know if I responded. Yes, no, I don't think I have anything further to add. I think you've clarified it very nicely, and I'm sorry to hear about your brother. Um, it's close to me because I lost my sister recently. Um, but it is very true what you say, that depth of feeling when one loses somebody close to one really brings you very deeply in touch with what's inside. And there is then that connection with that person. And when then one can also truly feel the love that one had for that person like you say, in a, in a different way, but a lot more profoundly perhaps than, than it was before, than one was aware that was there before. Thank you.
indulgences. We still have a few minutes, but maybe you would like to stand up and stretch again. Feel free. If you want to stand up and stretch. Al Alan M, may I ask you uh, in the interim, where 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 are you from? Um, I'm from Dublin originally, um, but I'm living in the UK at the moment. Okay, okay. Well, that's that's why I stepped out into the street. I looked the wrong way because I'm I'm an American. I looked the wrong way. That's why I almost got hit <laughs> by the bus. So thank you for saving. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. <laughs> Jeff, I have a question, if you have time. Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is, we talk about the Bodhisattva path and compassion and helping the others. I don't know, maybe it may be a weird question, but I want to ask, is there a way to help the the people we love who passed away? Mm. I don't know if it's the subject of Zen, but mm. it came out of me in, in these two days. Yes, you've had loved ones pass away recently yeah. also, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, but for you here and now, I would suggest considering how to live your life to honor their memory. You understand? 50%, not hmm? exactly, not exactly. I well, mean for example, uh, for me, there's nothing more important than what I would call living truly. Hmm not living in my dreams, living in my head, but living truly this precious life that I've been given. Uh, my mother passed away, my father passed away, my oldest brother passed away, my twin sister passed away. So I wouldn't say I think about it much, but in living my life, I feel that I wouldn't say I'm carrying them with me, but I'm honoring their memory. In, in living truly, I'm confident that that is precisely what they would want for me. You understand? Yeah, yes. So rather than, it's quite natural to think about what could I do for them now that they've passed away, huh? Yeah. But it's really what they're doing. For me, isn't it? Yeah. Actually, <clears throat> sir. <clears throat> Actually, I had an idea. If from this world I can help their rebirth. Kind of weird question, but I don't know. That's that's a gut feeling within within me. Can I help their rebirth mm -hmm. in their next life? to have a better position, I don't know, whatever. Would that something be possible? Yeah, it's true. Zen doesn't talk a lot about that, but other schools of Buddhism do. If you're familiar, for example, several traditions in Tibetan Buddhism huh, would take that up as a very serious question. Uh, Zen 
in a way downplays that issue. Stress of Zen is realize it here and now. Yeah. And the question, the problem of a past life or a future life is done. Is done. Isn't it because you haven't really realized it here and now that you're preoccupied with a past life or a future life? I don't know. Consider well. To be honest, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. What if you were clear about this very moment? Hmm? Yeah, but that's the mind working, and yeah. your heart is saying another thing. What is your heart? At saying? least my, my heart. What is your heart saying? I have a big, big grief in, with my grief, grief. Yes, yes. Oh, my mother, my brother, my yeah. father. Yeah. But is it not worthy for you to live your life truly and genuinely? Is that not a fine way to honor their memory? Isn't that what they would want? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I find a, I find a way to live the life. But yeah, things to come to my mind, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a little weak on past lives and future lives. No, it's okay. I just, I don't know. So I just look for an answer. Anyway, thank you very much. I trust you'll find what you need. Yeah. I appreciate it. If anyone else would like to speak up, please feel free. Mighty Claude, nothing? Jeff, if nobody else has a question, I have a question. Yes, Colin, is it, huh? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, you're talking about the birds singing and and some folks came back to that in our discussions. Uh, and so my question is, you, you mentioned that Ha Quinn reached enlightenment. I think it was the phrase was when stone met bamboo, something yeah, like that. That. Hock, that was a Chinese Zen master, not Ha Quinn, but it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. okay. So is that a reference to the, the importance of the mundane in our lives and reaching uh, um, in, in living a life that is truly um, um, spiritual and wise? On the surface, yes. But uh, to give a little background to the story, this was a monk who was very brilliant and he lived 12, 1300 years ago. And he was so brilliant that eventually his teacher, remember what I was speaking earlier about the teacher and the student, huh? Yeah. It didn't very well. The teacher called him one day and said, all I want you to tell me is directly, what is your original face before you were born? I don't want the results of your learning and study. Well, the brilliant disciple went back and went through all of his notes and came up with very brilliant answers, all of which the master naturally rejected. Said, no, no, that's the result of your learning, intellectual knowledge. It's not your original face, is it? Oh, finally, the monk got completely desperate, despaired. I'll, I'll, never, I'll never get it. He said, at this point, a picture of food will not satisfy hunger which became a very common popular Chinese saying to this day. So he left, he gave up on the surface, he gave up and he went and he ended up tending the gravesite of a national teacher, a famous Zen master who had recently passed away. 
nameless, virtually homeless, hearing the birds sweeping the grounds to keep it clean. But something must have been working very deeply within him. Huh? That doubt must have been continuing. So it, in a sense, it has nothing to do with in everyday life. Yes, it has to do with everyday events, but you have to see the depth with which he was when he happened to be sweeping one day, had completely given up, hmm? no chance. And then he hit a stone and it struck against the bamboo. Pop, and that sound, he completely awakened. It said he took a bath, bowed in the direction of his master and said, if you had taught it to me, at one point he even begged his master to tell me, tell me what is my original face? And the master said, anything I say would be my words, not yours. You would regret it later. Now he understands huh? why the teacher refused to be a teacher in the ordinary sense. And he said, if, I, if you had taught me when I begged you to tell me, I would not have had this day. Hmm? I, the debt I owe you is greater than the debt I owe my mother and my father. Hashim, you listening? This is very deep for a Chinese person. <laughs> the debt I owe you is greater than the debt I owe my mother and my father. He went on to become one of the great Zen masters. Huh? And as I mentioned, the master in that story who refused to be a master, <laughs> so that the disciple can really be who he is. Huh? That was Guishan, that was Guishan. But again, it's not just talking about everyday life, we sweep the garden and that's enlightenment. <laughs> you have to see from inside where he was when that stone hit the bamboo. When my teacher was about 15 years old, he heard that story and was so moved he and his friends in the temple, they were acolytes at that time. They spent the whole afternoon throwing stones at bamboo and they said, but they were none the more <laughs> enlightened by it. <laughs> that misses the point. You see, yeah. take care with these stories. We've about run out of time, Milan, my apologies. But uh, again, what we are doing is something all together. Huh? It's not one way. Huh? We are, we are supporting and being supported by each other. It, genuine Zen has always been this way and it always will. Thank you all for being a part of it. Uh, thank you all for participating and thank you, Jeff, for the talk. We'll uh, stop the recording now. Can you hear that? You're in New York. <laughs> Who are they hammering for? It's uh, a different kind of chirp. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll stop the recording and uh, do a, let's say, seven minute break and, and meet at 12.05, 4.05 London.